Well, this is a uh, sort of, kind of midweek update. Uh, I just wanted to share with you a few things that I'm uh, working on for Sunday and looking at. Uh, but I just received a, a message or saw a Facebook post from a friend uh, that Amir Sarfati's uh, son uh, is ill in Israel with COVID. So I appreciate it if you would pray, pray for him. He's, I think he's eight years old. So I got a new mic and today and thought I'd try it out and do, as I said, a sort of kind of midweek update. Uh, just looking at a few things, this is not going to be comprehensive like I usually do on Sundays. It's just going to be looking at a few issues. There is a controversy that's developed over a, uh, a software thing called the, the Pegasus Project. There's been a series of articles this week in The Guardian uh, from the UK newspaper talking about uh, this Israel Israeli developed security hacking software that's been used. Now, according to the leaks uh, from the project, there were about 50,000 um, gov governments have bought this software. They have to sign pretty strict agreements to use it. But uh, now the report is coming out that there were about 50,000 phone numbers of world leaders and important people that showed up on this um, that showed up on the list and that a lot of these were autocratic or strong leader governments that were using the software to spy on people within their uh, country or elsewhere. Uh, for example, Financial Times editor was among, uh, there were 180 journalists that were identified uh, by the spyware firm's clients. Uh, a number of other people, there are, uh, there's reports that the Saudis used this to uh, hack into the phone and, and location uh, data that came from uh, Khashoggi. There, uh, Mexico is said to have used it, uh, uh, Orban in Hungary. Uh, there are a lot of allegations now, Modi in, um, in, in India. So there are, this is a big controversy, and it's sort of tying back in some ways to Israel. Here's an article the next day uh, on uh, Modi using it. Uh, this is considered pretty serious by a lot of different people. It's being used to tar uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. There's some allegations that wherever Netanyahu went, this Pegasus Project software uh, followed. Uh, again, there's, it's still early on in the uh, exposure of this thing, and this is a, a newspaper uh, but I think they've done a pretty good uh, pretty good idea of uh, putting it uh, together. The revelation came out uh, the third day of articles in The Guardian that Macron and 13 world leaders were on the leaked data list. Uh, and they you know, show all the different people. Um, the president of South Africa, uh, the, uh, uh, one of the leaders in Morocco, uh, Saad Hariri from Lebanon, a uh, number of others. So, and then there's 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 a lot of political fallout. It's just it's not shaking out, and because of the the COVID thing and some of the things that are going on in the world and the economy and supply chain problems, it's not yet getting a tremendous amount um, of of press. Uh, that you, from which you can draw specific con conclusions. Uh, one of the countries that's said to have used it is the United Arab Emirates. The uh, Sheik um, of Dubai has used this to track uh, his, I think it's his fifth or sixth wife, um, and I mean fifth or sixth that he has at one time. Um, and, you know, as I said, when I talked about this a couple months ago when the Jordanian coup was going on, uh, this fifth or sixth wife, it's always the fifth or sixth wife that causes you the biggest problems, I guess. That's a joke. 
but uh, his uh, Princess Haya, his wife, fled to England. Uh, they've been going through a pretty nest- nasty divorce, uh, so there's allegations that the sheik was using this software to spy on his wife, who happens to be the half-sister of King Abdullah of Jordan. So King Abdullah II of Jordan. So this is tied into, in some respects, uh, the UAE is tied into, the, at least in the Jordanian minds, uh, the Jordanian royal family's mind that uh, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates might be uh, going after Jordan. And the reason that uh, they think Saudi Arabia is going after Jordan is because there's a secret agreement or there was a secret agreement reached between uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and Benjamin Netanyahu that the Saudis would take over the control of the Temple Mount that would give them the control of the three holiest sites in Islam. So there's a lot of intrigue about this. There was also another uh, UAE princess who fled. Uh, she was uh, on a, a yacht in the Indian Ocean, and Indian commandos from India came and uh, pulled her off the boat and sent her back to uh, Dubai. So there's a there's very authoritarian regime. We think of Dubai as being this great freedom-loving place, but that's not necessarily the case. So I think you need to watch uh, this. This is, again, the concern of the intrusiveness of tech in this. Amazon came in and shut down uh, the all the accounts linked to Israel's NSO group, which has produced the spyware that's involved in these allegations. Um, To give you kind of an example of what's going on, I I don't know that this is the best example, but uh, there was somebody pretty pretty high up in the uh, Catholic hierarchy in the archbishops, a priest who was outed this week that he had been visiting gay hookup websites and places and a software firm had tracked or had used commercially available tracking information to dig into databases that are supposed to be anonymous, but they're not really anonymous. They give enough information that if somebody unpacks the information using software the right way, they can find out where a person has been, who they've, who they've seen, uh, the websites that they frequented and that sort of thing. Because while the tech companies say, well, you know, all of this information is private, there are entrepreneurs that have figured out ways to unlock all of the location data. If you remember back in the early days of the COVID outbreak, uh, the United or um, the New York Times had. Uh, started a thing called the Privacy Project where they expressed concerns about this where they were able to track students from universities to spring break back in 2020. Uh, That information was also used to track things about some of the uh, rallies and protests that took place in the nation's capital in early January. The New York Times has expressed some concern about this as all the availability of this information. So Again, it's just a showing how intrusive all of this technology is. This priest, by the way, has been forced to resign. Uh, and so there is, you know, where on the one hand, where you don't want to condone in any way what he was doing, there is also concern with the intrusive nature of the technology. And this is, I think, a significant prophetic issue because we know that there will be uh, this intrusive technology of some kind used by the Antichrist. So you see the foundations of that being laid now in the way that it's being used. Um, There's also a company called CSIS, the Center for Strategic and International Studies. It's a think tank based in Washington, D.C. They've been doing a lot of things with cybersecurity and that sort of thing. It's just, and I'm only pointing this out, is they've used the term Babel, translating the Middle East in terms of 
uh, the podcasts that they've developed with regard to the Middle East. It's just interesting that they picked up the term Babel at this particular time. I, I, I don't think these things happen by, by accident. They do have a new uh, series out on the development of quantum computing and how that will impact security. Uh, you can go to their website, CSIS.org, I believe is the website, and you can see their recent thing that they did on quantum computing. Very technical, but this, if quantum computing actually comes about, this will have huge privacy and security um, ramifications. Now, Sunday I talked a little bit about the Levant. Uh, you need to know that there is a tremendous amount of, I think, turmoil, instability, and just a lot of things are developing. And we know that this is sort of the, not sort of, this is the core focus of a lot of end times Bible prophecy. It's not the sum of all of it, but it is the focus of some. So I'll just take a quick look at uh, some things going on in Egypt, uh, maybe Jordan, uh, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, all of these countries are in a good bit of turmoil right now. Not just because of the COVID thing, but also because of just politics. So one of the things that's uh, going on is this dispute is growing between Ethiopia and Egypt. Despite months and months, even years of negotiation to try to stop Ethiopia from doing anything, Ethiopia has completed its second filling of the dam, and my understanding is will shortly, if they have not already, start generating electricity from the dam. They've uh, put enough water in there that they can now discharge water through the turbines to create electricity, which Ethiopia needs. They're a developing country. They want more electricity. Uh, hydropower water, uh, generated from water flow is uh, carbon neutral, but Egypt does not like this. Egypt has come out and said through its diplomats that uh, it is an ex existential threat to the existence of Egypt. Now, I have some questions about this because when Egypt built the Aswan Dam back in the 1960s, and they had to fill the Aswan Dam, the lake behind the Aswan Dam, Lake Nasser, was there this concern that they were shutting off the water flow of the Nile? Um, so again, but this is politics. Egypt has threatened war. They've tried to go to the Security Council. The Security Council has said that the party should negotiate and mediate, even arbitrate their dispute but that they don't think that they have really any power to do anything. And here's what the foreign minister said, Egypt will defend its citizens with all means available if their livelihoods are threatened by GERD. Um, now the other development that's come, now this is reported by Hot Rets, which is a left-wing newspaper, but uh, the article does make some sense that uh, Egypt is now turning some of its anger over the situation towards Israel. The reason being that Israel and Egypt entered into a peace agreement 40-some uh, years ago. Under the terms of that peace agreement, Israel was not supposed to give aid or comfort to people that might be the um, enemy of, of the of. Now, that's in some dispute, but it is causing some diplomatic tension between Israel and Egypt. Probably talk more about this on Sunday. Um, also, this crisis in Lebanon continues. Things have not gotten better. Uh, there was a pretty good article at Al Jaminer about the fact that Hezbollah, they expect Hezbollah, Steve Emerson wrote this, to uh, exploit the chaos in Lebanon. 
here's what Emerson's article says. Lebanon is going through one of the, the gravest economic depressions in modern history. More than half of the country's population now lives in poverty, and the country's currency has plummeted by 90%. Fuel shortages have led to fights at gas stations and the shutdown of critical power stations. The Middle Eastern state is now on the brink of a social explosion. This dire warning from caretaker Prime Minister Hassan Diab was issued on July 6 as he desperately called for, the interna for international help to save the Lebanese from death and prevent the demise of his country. Uh, Emerson also says in his article, Hezbollah sim similarly continues to strengthen its presence internationally using regions in Latin America and in Europe as a base for drug trafficking, arms smuggling, fundraising, recruitment, espionage, and terror operations. And they're also using the crisis in Lebanon to increase their power and influence there. In some parts of Lebanon, Hezbollah is the only entity that is providing social services that people need. Uh, Emerson continues in his article, Hezbollah does not have an incentive to formally seize control over the Lebanese state, despite having the capabilities to do so. Uh, there is a think tank in, in the UK called Chatham House uh, issued a report. Uh, they said that Hezbollah pre prefers maintaining a calibrated level of indirect influence to avoid full accountability. However, as Lebanon continues to descend towards potential state collapse, Hezbollah's incentives could change. The group's leadership could take even more power instead of standing by. Western governments, therefore, need to be pre prepared seriously for a scenario whereby an Iran-backed terrorist organization consolidates further control of our country on Israel's doorstep. And there is a... Uh, a good report from Chatham House called Hez How Hezbollah Holds Sway Over the Lebanese State. And it talks about how um, Hezbollah is going to try to use this crisis to expand its control over Lebanon. Right now they can just say, well, we're just sort of part of the government. We're not responsible for everything. But at some point, I think, Hezbollah is going to take over the government just to prevent the entire country from collapsing. Again, this has huge, I think, huge and rather large uh, Bible prophecy uh, Bible prophecy implications. Um, Israel also, or Iran, has also come out with some new. Uh, a new warship that's uh, a catamaran. It's supposed to be very agile. It's based on some very similar in design to North Korean and Norwegian uh, ships. So this is something that it showed up on the, the satellite. Some of the people that track these things um, have seen that the new warship is now actually being put into the ocean. I wanted to follow up a little bit, too, on what I mentioned briefly on Sunday, this article from Israel Hayom that uh, Zarif, the foreign minister of Iran, has released a, a document to some of his sources which, where he can get this published uh, that by, the Biden administration is making numerous concessions or is going to be making numerous concessions in the near future to Iran, regardless of whether they enter into the JCPOA or they come to the negotiating table. Now, it's possible that, uh, as I mentioned Sunday, it's possible that this is just a, the typical way that they, the Iranians negotiate. They put these things out there. They... Um, say that this is what our the, our opponents have agreed to, when in fact it's just a complete fabrication. But you have to balance that against the fact that the Biden administration is out there making these concessions to Iran. Uh, for example, here's an article from the Tehran Times and also in Israel Hayom. Um, it says here, and that's not all. If the Rizzi government returns to the nuclear deal, Zarif's document will not only um, re repeal sanctions, but also congressional 
resolutions against Iran and the president's sanctions, the removal of which will directly affect Israel. The personal sanctions on Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei and his bureau will be lifted. And above all, Trump's decision of April 2019 to define the Revolutionary Guards as a foreign terrorist organization will be revoked. The clear implication of such a move is that American actions, such as the assassination of Quds Force Commander Qassem Soleimani on January 3rd, 2020, will not be repeated, leaving the state of Israel alone in its efforts against the regional pro-Iranian axis of terrorism. I think this has uh, prophetic implications. We know that Israel will eventually at some point be left standing alone. Uh, article says, finally, Iran's panic over the nuclear bomb will also receive a windfall as it understands more than a thousand people, companies, and entities will return to operating without restrictions. One particularly notable one stands out, the Iranian Atomic Energy Agency with all its affiliates and research bodies. So this led, this is a, a good article by Seth Fransman in uh, Sunday's Jerusalem Post. Iran and Syria and Israeli st strategy choices. Right now, uh, they consider this, the IDF considers this sort of the, um, the, the period of calm between the wars. We had the second Lebanon war in 2006. Everybody knows there's a third Lebanon war coming. It's possible that the quieting down of things a little bit over the past month has been because Iran is distracted. They had elections, uh, Raisi, Raisi uh, a, known as the butcher of Tehran, was elected president. He'll be taking office here shortly. But there's also a lot of turmoil going on in Iran. Uh, this is an article from this morning's, Thursday morning's New York Times. Severe water shortages had a volatile element to challenges in Iran. This has led to, um, this has led to uh, this, uh, demonstrations, even riots across many cities in Iran, even in the oil-rich areas. People are just very distressed. Here's a picture of a young man who was uh, uh, shot and killed, uh, shot in the head and back by the security forces in one of the cities where these protests are going in. So Iran has a lot of things going on. This is true in a lot of countries in the Middle East right now. You have Lebanon is in turmoil. Uh, Iran is in turmoil. Iraq is in turmoil. There appears to be developing turmoil in Afghanistan. Uh, there's a, economic issues going on in Turkey. And Iran has a lot of problems. So for a number of reasons, one is their, what I consider to be their demographic problem. They have a very low birth rate. So I think that some of the things that we see in Bible prophecy will happen, happen sooner rather than later because uh, Iran is maybe at its peak right now and it will start declining so it knows it has to act if it's going to act soon it needs to do this that's why it's pushing to get its nuclear program uh, back on track at the same time we also have this um, problems in syria this is a couple weeks ago jonathan spire where he said this about syria the current direction of events points to the prospect of a kind of lebanization or rackification if that is a word of Syria. That is the emergence of a situation in which a weak government in name only exists and is accepted internationally. Beneath this flimsy structure, a powerful independent Iranian political military capacity will have freedom of action, control significant territory, and be able to use the nominal central government as a useful cloak for its activities. Security control on the ground in these areas is in the hands of the Iranians and their associated Arab militias. The forces of the Assad regime are able to operate only with Iranian permission. Alongside the military structures, Iran is seeking to entrench itself in the economic life of the area and to secure the loyalty of the population. Tehran controls 
significant oil facilities in this area. Most importantly, um, the T2 station, a vital pumping facility on the Kirkuk Banyas pipeline, is in the hands of Iran. It has made some inroads into the tribal structures of Dar al Zor, maintaining good relations with elements of the powerful Ab Bagara tribe. Less successful efforts have even been made at promoting Shia Islam among the Sunni Arab population of the area. That's also sort of related to a significant development in Jordan, where Jordan has now opened tourism to uh, Shia Islam tourists, Islamic tourists, to come into Jordan to go to some of the shrines there that are important to uh, Shiites. This is not something that's happened recently. So because of that development, which some people think is a reaction to the belief that Saudi Arabia, the holder of the uh, Sunni holy sites of Mecca and Medina, they're also holy to the Shiites, but the Sunni uh, Saudi Arabians are in charge of Mecca and Medina. They're threatening to go after the Temple Mount they seem to be making moves in that regard. Jordan doesn't want to lose its control of that holy site, even though it's questionable whether there was any Islamic, um, even though it's questionable whether there was any Islamic uh, tie to Jerusalem. The Quran, the Quran doesn't mention it, and there's a lot of there's some scholarly Sunni. Um, theologians, historians that question whether Jerusalem has any importance in, in Islam. Nevertheless, the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan does not want to lose control, uh, what control it has over the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And remember that the Saudis were the ones that kicked the Hashemites out of Saudi Arabia, where until the 1920s, the control of the Islamic holy sites of Mecca and Medina had been under the control of the Hashemite family, King Abdullah's ancestors, for hundreds of years. So it was a pretty significant thing that happened about a hundred years ago uh, when the Hashemites got kicked out and were given the Kingdom of Jordan as a kind of consolation prize. So that factors into a lot of this. Now, I just want to make some brief comments. I'll talk more about this on Sunday. The uh, Russia media, uh, this is a good article at Memory, Middle East Media Research Institute, talking about the updated Russian national security strategy. In early July, Putin signed, in, signed this um, document to update for the first time in about six years the Russian national security strategy. A uh, pretty good article about uh, what happened. And it, it, this is what mem the memory article says. Paragraphs 84 to 93 are of this update are devoted to the protection of traditional spiritual and moral values. As one commentator says, this is a grim innovation. It captures the turnabout that has taken place with Putinism since 2014. In the 2009 national security concept, such a description of spiritual threats, threats would have been impossible. So you need to understand that there's a, there seems to be a spiritual component to what Putin is doing. You might remember probably about eight or nine years ago, uh, the Investor's Business Daily had this rather strange story. They were quoting an, uh, a blog by a religious Arab, a Muslim, who had said, I believe the person was from the Middle East. I'd have to go back and check. I did talk about it, that Putin, as he was getting to, ready to invade Crimea, had taken a icon, what what was the, the the original icon was lost, but the icon that they still venerated, 
called the Lady Our Lady of Kazan, a black Madonna icon of the Russian Orthodox Church, and put it on a plane and flew it around the area that they were going to invade. The um, and this was an icon that Pope John Paul II, uh, a, a version of it, or I think the oldest version of it that was closest to the original that got destroyed, uh, Pope John Paul II had that icon in his private chapel, and he would pray to that icon of Mary, this black Madonna, every day. When Putin went to the Vatican while Pope John Paul II was still alive, they had a meeting, and at the meeting, this icon was set on a table right between the Pope and Pope John Paul II. And the icon that Pope John Paul II had was later returned. He wanted to return it to Russia himself. But there was just this kind of very strange article in Investor's Business Daily, of all places, about Putin using this icon. If you look at it historically, you know that this icon was used to lead Russian troops into battle. I think it was used, the original of the icon, led the Russian troops into the battle against Napoleon at Waterloo. So it has, it's venerated in the Russian Orthodox Church, and Putin has sort of incorporated some of that Russian Orthodox religion and spirituality into his nationalism. Now there's an article by a guy named Alexander Dugan, uh, and I'm trying to remember, oh, Al Mayadeen, uh, published that this just the uh, yesterday, Russian return to the Middle East. So I'm going to read a little bit of this article here. By the way, this is the icon that Putin, um, this black Madonna that uh, is venerated in Russia, and it's kept in a, I believe it's in a chapel now in the Kremlin. But Russian return to the Middle East. Alexander Dugan. Now, Alexander Dugan is kind of a, um, people kind of compare him or call him a modern day Rasputin. He has kind of a spiritual side to him. He's big on Eurasian geopolitical analysis and thought and planning. About four or five years ago, Foreign Affairs did a big article on him called Putin's Brain. So he's had a lot of influence over Putin, but he wrote this article, Russian Return to the Middle East. Essentially, he says, look, Russia gave up the communism, it's now nationalism and a liberal form of capitalism, but a lot of what Russia is doing as it's moving into the Middle East, returning to the Middle East and Syria and elsewhere, is has a huge, not so much an ideological component to it, but a economic component to it. I think you can see in Ezekiel 38, assuming that Russia is one of the players there, that there seems to be a very strong economic component. So I'm only passing this along because I think it's showing how some of the pieces are falling into place. Um, Dugan's article concludes with this. No matter what is the reason for the rejection of the West by the Muslim population in the Middle East, religious, economic, national, or others, uh, Russia is essentially in the Middle East to secure multipolarity, not insisting on what it should come in exchange for liberalism. This realism and this flexibility open totally new historical opportunities to Russian-Arab friendship. Again, focusing on the, the religious component. Now, CSIS, the uh, Center for the uh, uh, Strategic and International Studies, also released a report this week called Russia's Corporate Soldiers. And so what you see in this, I think, well-done piece, looking at the different uh, places that Russia is trying to exert influence throughout the world, particularly in the Middle East, is that they are using these private contractors private militias to do their bidding. It's, it's very similar to the, the way the Iranians go in and operate. It shows the different areas that Russia is trying, in which Russia is trying to exert influence. 
you have Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Azerbaijan, Libya, Sudan. And these are, I think this is prophetically significant. For example, here is, uh, we know that Russia has been involved in Syria for quite some time, exerting a tremendous amount of influence in, in Syria. They've also been involved in um, Libya, which if you look at the way the coalition forms in Ezekiel 38, 39, Libya is part of that. Another part of that is Sudan. And there's been a push by Russia. <coughs> there's been a push by Russia to move into Sudan. Not going entirely smoothly, but they have started exerting some influence over the uh, port of Sudan that's important to them. They're trying to get these port facilities. This, again, I think has potentially prophetic implications. It's a piece of the puzzle that's coming together. Russia this week also did a test launch of its Zircon missile. Uh, as this newspaper report says, that this has the uh, ability to completely change warfare rules in the world. Now, Zircon must missile was originally uh, brought to fore about back in 2019, 2018 and 2019. Putin started talking about it. You see here's the commander of the Russian military at this. And so this missile that they've developed uh, can fly at up to Mach 9 nine times the speed of sound. So what would that be? Over 6,000 miles per hour. The other thing that it does is it, it it's launched high, but it comes in and then glides low and can maneuver around, which makes it very difficult for missile defense systems to pick it up. Uh, as it's coming in at uh, Mach 6, Mach 7, Mach 9, at about 200 feet above the surface, at a distance of 34 miles, um, the a ship that's trying to defend against this missile has less than 20 seconds to react. That's really not much time to get your missile defense systems targeted. Um, so this is um, in the test flight that they did this week. Russia was able to achieve uh, speed on the missile of Mach 7. So I'm going to say it's over 5,000, 5,400 miles an hour, which is really renders almost every ship and fleet in the world, assuming it's completely operational, very vulnerable. Uh, it is believed that this missile would be capable of taking out, one missile would be, could be able to take out a nuclear aircraft carrier. Uh, so I know that the, uh, Britain and the United States are very concerned about the vulnerability of their um, aircraft carriers. This leads me to this Institute for the Study of War, understandingwar.org is their website, showing that Turkey and Russia are in this sort of strange geopolitical dance where they have both uh, unified interest and competing interest in a lot of different areas. One of them is in Libya. One is in the Caucasus region in Syria. And I think this, again, is a potential issue. Uh, here is what the key takeaway of the article, Russian-Turkey competition as of July 2021, from uh, the Institute for the Study of War. Key takeaway. The Russo-Turkish relationship has become a defining driver of conflict in a vast region from North Africa to Central Asia. Turkey and Russia shared object Turkey and Russia's shared objective to make the current international system more multipolar leads them to cooperate in many areas, but differences and desired outcomes have led to more frequent com confrontations in Syria and the Caucasus. Both states' ability to compartmentalize their cooperative and competitive activities will likely determine the degree of instability caused by their assertive foreign policies. The United States and its allies must find 
the right avenues of cooperation with Turkey to counter a re- Russian influence and limit the risk of rapid fire cross theater escalation between the Kremlin and Ankara. Um, Russian President Putin and Turkish President Erdogan share an opposition to the current Western led international order. Erdogan wants to transform Turkey into an independent and influential global power while remaining a key member of NATO. He sees engagement with Russia as a crucial to expand Turkey's reach and diversity and diversify its partners beyond the West. Putin wants to undermine Western-led institutions and reestablish Russia as an essential actor in a multipolar world. Putin sees Turkey's goal of strategic independence as instrumental to, po- ex- to exacerbating policy divisions in the West and undermining NATO. So this is a thing that needs to be uh, looked at in more detail, this sort of dance that's going, geopolitical dance that's going on between Russia and Turkey. And we'll talk a little bit more about it. I think the, the what I always call the Stan Republics of Central Asia, which are Islamic and Turkic in their orientation language, a or religious orientation and language, I think this is a, a component of how these things form come together in the end times that I think is missed or just glossed over a lot of time. I think this is very significant. And I think when you look at this map, uh, you see these areas of potential conflict, but cooperation and what is Russia doing to protect itself? Because Russia has a very significant Islamic population uh, that they've been struggling to deal with. And I think that one way that they might be able to deal with it to protect Russia and the nationalism of Russia and the Russian Orthodox Church is to enter into some kind of agreement with these Islamic countries about dealing with Israel. That's a that's a potential issue. I think it's something that needs to be considered. I'm saying I'm not saying that that's exactly how it's going to work out, but I think it's something that needs to be considered. And then this, and I'll talk more about this on Sunday too. The tweet that could have sparked a religious war. Uh, Prime Minister Naftali Bennett did a tweet and said that uh, he wants freedom of worship for Jews on the Temple Mount. Now he's walked that back, but you need to understand that uh, there has been a pretty significant change uh, since this May conflict that happened, that uh, Jews have returned to walking around the Temple Mount, but they are now openly praying and they're being permitted to openly pray. This is a significant change. They used to get arrested when they did this. So I believe one day they had almost 1,200 Jews go up on the Temple Mount. Um, This is, I think it's a pretty big deal. Uh, This is a big, significant change. And we'll talk more about this and its prophetic implications. So thanks for uh, watching. Uh, Like, subscribe, share whatever you want to do, appreciate it. And we'll talk more about some of these issues on Sunday. Thank you.